Hey, I'm Tad, the Associate Pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for this recorded service online. If you would like more information about our service times where you could come join us in person, you can see those at wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us at info at wilkesborobaptist.org. We hope that you enjoy it. God bless. Let's sing this song today, Great Things. same God loves us. He loves you and he loves me. Let's sing this to him. Oh, how he loves you and me. Together. 
We are, uh, we're glad you're here worshiping with us. 246 years ago tomorrow will be the celebration of our na nation's declaration of independence. And ever since the pilgrims first made their way to the new world, uh, religious values and religious freedoms have played an integral role in our nation's history. But much has happened in the last 246 years between the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights and, and all the challenges and the divisions politically, by the way, the divisions politically that have been present in our country since its founding, about the only presidential election that went off without any kind of significant division and controversy was the first one. And ever since, they've been arguing back and forth about who should be president. And just so you know, the division that we have now is really not all that different than divisions we've had previously. Yet much has changed over the last 246 years. For a significant portion of our nation's history, at least a Christian worldview or a Judeo-Christian worldview predominantly uh, led the, the laws and the framework of the way that we operated as a nation. That has ceased to be reality. We no longer operate in a fundamentally Judeo-Christian ethic we operate under a secular ethic uh, with that, that operates with some sort of sense of religious fervor. They believe they're right on the other side of many political and value issues, and we believe we're right on another side of those value and political issues because we have Scripture as our authority. And so we live in a country where there is significant division, and, and that creates a tension, particularly for us as Christians, because we want God to do his work and have his way in the nation in which we live. And many of us, some of you that are a little older than me, but even, even me, I can remember back when the, the predominant way that we operated was under a sense of morality and righteousness that at least we were comfortable with, even if it didn't go quite as far as we would have liked it to go. And the tension we wrestle with is what do we do about that? And in our country today, there are different ideas and concepts about what we ought to do. One concept is to pursue uh, trying to make the United States Christian again and, and kind of conceptualize everything we are uh, as a Christian nation. That assumes that we as America 
have in, are, are basically like the Old Testament Israel or, or the city of Jerusalem. In other words, that we have a mandate by God to function from a biblical perspective. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm not sure that we are Jerusalem. And I'm not sure that we as a nation have that mandate in order to step in and say, okay, everything around us has got to operate in a Christian framework. I think if that's our mindset, we may be fighting a losing battle. Because of that one side of the tension, there are others in the Christian perspective who argue that we're not living in Jerusalem, we're, our, we're living in Babylon. We're living in a place that is full of wickedness and sinfulness and evil, and we've got to figure out how do we act as Christians inside a culture that is decidedly non-Christian. Uh, the, the assumption in that view is sometimes that we need to retreat, that we just need to retreat to our confines and our communities, and if we, we let this gathering of followers of Jesus every week be our respite, then whatever we do the rest of the time is, is kind of up, up to us. I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure either of those two basic perspectives, or it might be safe to say extreme perspectives, is where we ought to be. For me, I lament, and I read in my scripture reading this week from Isaiah chapter 64. By the way, our text comes from Luke chapter 6, if you'll turn there in just a moment. I read in my scripture reading this week in Isaiah 64, where Isaiah prayed, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as when the fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, and that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. He goes on to continue praying that God would step into the world, intervene, that show off his greatness and his glory. For many of you that are followers of Jesus, maybe you've prayed something similar. God, won't you just step in? Won't you just show your greatness and your glory? Won't you just intervene and bring revival? Won't you just bring change? Won't you just bring conviction to the hearts and lives of sinners? And it struck me in my devotional reading and in my preparation for this sermon today. God has already done that. God has already stepped into the world. God already intervened in the course of human history. It happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus stepped into human flesh. And the reason I think this is important is because what I want us to grasp as followers of Jesus is what should our perspective be on trying to get the world around us to hear the right message and follow the right person? In fact, Jesus had a particular emphasis when all of the things around him were, were kind of uh, 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 circling in political confusion, in division, in divisiveness, in frustration. Jesus' solution was startlingly simple wonderfully gracious and and quite mind-boggling to be honest with you read with me this text luke chapter 6 verses 12 through 16 it's the text where jesus selected the 12 apostles who would particularly follow him for the last year and a half or so of his ministry read this with me in these days he went out of the mountain to pray and all night he continued in prayer to god when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, Andrew, his brother, James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Our sermon today is that Jesus encounters disciples. Jesus encounters those whom he would invite to follow him, he would invite to fulfill his mission in the world. Say, how does that connect with our Independence Day and Jesus' purpose in the world? Well, there's a phrase there that begins, in these days. In these days, it sets the context. And if you go back and look at earlier passages in Luke chapter 6 and also in Luke chapter 5, a number of weeks ago, we looked at the complement passage to that in the uh, in Gospel of Matthew where if you remember Jesus and his disciples, they walked through the grain fields and they picked those heads of grain and they ate those on the Sabbath day. And then Jesus went into the synagogue and he healed a man with a withered hand. And if you remember in that text, 
The religious leaders looked at those acts of effrontery in their own minds toward the Sabbath day as an act of disobedience to God, and they sought to arrest and kill Jesus. Okay? In these days, the context of Luke chapter 6 is that story. It is the story of when Jesus went into, into, uh, into those uh, synagogues. He healed that man who had a withered hand. He was confronting the religious leaders. And really what's bullet, what it's boiling down to is Jesus' ministry had probably been going on public ministry for about a year to year and a half. And in that year to year and a half, he had constantly barbed the religious leaders. Not just to make them mad. He wasn't like stirring up trouble to stir up trouble, but he was pointing to them to a real recognition of who God was, God is in human flesh, and the desire, his desire to get people to follow him. And what had taken place is he had stirred up the religious hornet's nest of the people in his own country. And see, the political divisions and the national divisions and the religious divisions were just as present 2,000 years ago in Israel as they are now in our own country. The Jewish people longed for a national Messiah. They longed for someone who would come and overthrow the Roman leaders. They longed for someone who would set up a kingdom on planet Earth that they could follow, that they could get behind, and that's what they wanted in a Messiah. The religious leaders in particular, the Pharisees, they wanted someone from their own tribe, someone from their own ideology, someone that would fit their own perspective. And when Jesus showed up, this rabbi miracle worker from Nazareth, they were troubled by uh, this man doing these things because he didn't fit their idea of what they should follow and who they should be. And and yet Jesus, when he came, he came to set up a kingdom, but not a kingdom like they thought he was going to set up, and certainly not an affirmation of all of their religious understandings. He came to challenge those things. And, And in this particular instance, here's what's taking place. Get this. Jesus knew exactly what the the conflict with the religious leaders meant. He knew that they wanted to arrest him. He knew that they wanted to try him. He knew that they wanted to turn him over to the Roman religious authorities. He knew that that's exactly what was going to take place. Don't lose sight. Jesus is... God in human flesh. He is not surprised at all, was not surprised at all by the conflict, the division, the frustration. He's not surprised by the fact that the religious leaders wanted him dead. And I believe when he assigned these 12 apostles to follow him particularly, he knew exactly what was going on. In fact, he knew what his future was going to be. And he knew that within a year and a half or so, he was going to be hanging on a Roman cross, dying for the sins of his people nationality-wise, the Jewish people and the peoples of all the world. And what did Jesus do? What, did you, what act did Jesus do when he, in those days, reflected on what the future was going to be? He didn't hold a crusade. He didn't, he didn't get up a political party. He didn't say... I want you to do what I tell you sociopolitically and all will be well. Just get this. He spent the night in prayer and invited 12 of the many who had followed him to be his primary apostles. I'm going to tell you something, folks. What God wants of us in the world is to follow him. There might be some implications, what it means for us as citizens, There certainly will be. There might be implications for what God wants of us in the way we interact with others in our community and across our world. But let me just tell you, at its heart, if we want to be a part of what God is doing in the world, we will follow Jesus. It's not that much more complicated than that. In fact, in this text, we're going to discover what it is to be on the journey of following Jesus. There are three steps on that journey, and what I'd like you to do is explore with me today where you are in your journey of following Jesus. First step on that journey is simply this. We are converted by faith in Jesus. Now, prior to this text, Jesus had encountered the disciples for the first time. This is after he had spent some time with them when he prayed for them and assigned them. And we could go back to the Gospel of John to see some of those interactions. On one occasion, Jesus was there with John the Baptist after his baptism. And John the Baptist had affirmed Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And a man by the name of Andrew was there. He had been following John the Baptist. 
And he heard John's affirmation, and Andrew went off and told his brother Peter. You know Peter, the famous disciple, the the lead disciple, even in our text. He's the first one noted in the text. He's always the preeminent disciple. We're going to talk about him in a little little bit more in a moment. But Andrew went to invite Peter to meet Jesus. Right after that, another encounter, Jesus met with Nathaniel, and he said to Nathaniel in this interaction, as Nathaniel and Philip were talking about Jesus being the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, Jesus looked at Nathaniel, approving his deity, his lordship. He said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, Nathaniel, I saw you. And what really took place in those moments, those first interactions with those first disciples, is conversion. Conversion. It's the idea that at some point in the past, these 12 met Jesus in a way that changed them internally and changed them eternally. Made a difference in them. And we're converted. How are we converted? By faith in Jesus. Now, obviously, Andrew and Nathaniel and Peter and James and John, at that moment when they met Jesus, they didn't know all that it would entail for their lives as followers of Christ. They didn't know what it would entail for them in the next two and a half or three years. They certainly didn't know what it would entail for the next 30, 40, 50 years of their human experience. They just knew that they had met someone that was different. They knew they met someone who was not like the other religious leaders. They knew they met someone that if they put their time and attention on him, something would change in them. And they were converted. Converted how? By faith in Jesus. We've talked about this week after week. We've talked about this in this series. We'll talk about this again next week. How are we converted? We're converted by faith. When you and I believe that Jesus is the living Son of God, that He died on a cruel Roman cross, that He rose from the dead so that we might have eternal life, we're converted by faith in Jesus. And Jesus then is the one that changes us on the inside. What does that look like in our own lives? Let me give you an application. Uh, First, it's to be converted. We'll we'll come back and I'll, I'll spell that out in just a moment at the end of the sermon. But it's also to invite others to be converted. Folks, if the Bible is true and Jesus is who he says he is, then every person on planet earth is going to have to answer for what they believe about Jesus and whether they follow Jesus. That's what scripture tells us. And the most significant thing that you and I can do The most significant thing you and I can do, aside from following Jesus personally, is inviting others to follow Jesus. You want to change our world? You want to change our country? You want to see things happen in our land that are different? You want to see God do a work in our lives? Then I'm not sure political activism is the primary means for doing that. It is helping people know there is a Savior who died on the cross for their sins. I love Andrew, how he took... Peter and said, Peter, we've met the Messiah just recently in the life of our church. There have been quite a few in the life of our church who brought friends and family to know Jesus. Sometimes it happens with an odd phone call, an out-of-the-way phone call. I got one a number of weeks ago from someone who had loosely been connected to our church. We sat and talked about some stuff going on in his life, and guess what? He gave his heart and life to Jesus. Because about six or seven years ago, somebody invited that family to worship here. And they worshiped here for a number of weeks. And essentially, I'm the only pastor that fella had. So he called me when he was going through a crisis, put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. At VBS, we had at least six children put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ during that last week, last night of VBS, and several others that are on the cusp of doing just that thing. And some of those friends... Friends of my boys who who they spent week after week, hey, mom, will you make sure that so-and-so comes to church tonight? Will you make sure that so-and-so comes to Awana? Hey, mom, will you make sure that so-and-so comes there? We've got other friends, another friend who we're going to baptize next Sunday. Now, not only did my boys invite him, but another friend at church invited him. And one of his school teachers at church prayed for him the entirety of the school year because she knew God was working in his heart and in his life. Invitations, opportunities, response, a chance to hear the gospel. You know what God does when we invite people to meet Jesus? God wants to save them, folks, more than you want them saved. He wants to care for them and redeem them. And so let me beg of you, if you're here and you're converted to a faith relationship with Jesus Christ, amen. But don't stop. Invite someone else 
to know Jesus and to follow Jesus. We're called, or we are, we, are, we are converted, rather, by faith in Jesus. Let me give you the second step in the faith journey. It's this. We are called to follow Jesus. True disciples are converted by faith in Jesus. True disciples are called to follow Jesus, and that's the invitation God gives us here today. We're called to follow Him. Many of you in this room, today is not the day that you need conversion. In fact, probably for most everyone in this worship center today, you've already been converted. At some point in your spiritual history, you came to a realization that you were a sinner and you needed a Savior. Maybe it was a vacation Bible school when you were a child. Maybe it was when you were a teenager. Maybe it was through a conversation you had with mom or dad. Maybe it was at a revival service or in a church service where a pastor was preaching the gospel. But you are converted. You know that you're going to spend eternity with God when you die. But I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to say something that I've watched all too often in, in church circles. Sometimes the faith journey of many Christians stops at conversion. And after you put your faith and trust in Jesus, that's really where your faith ends. I want to tell you something. Jesus did not invite Andrew and Peter and John and James and those other disciples and any of those that followed him. He did not invite them to experience conversion and stop. He invited them to follow him. Not long after those first interactions, Jesus was walking along the seashore after Peter and James and John had had a fishing trip and they couldn't catch anything. And he told them to cast their nets on the other side. You remember that? And they hauled in a great net of fish and all of those stories. And then Jesus looked at them and had the audacity to say to them, leave everything behind. Stop fishing. Come follow me and I'll make you fishers and men. I'll tell you something, we have been invited to follow Jesus. And what we believe, how we behave, what we do, how we act, Jesus is not just invited us to get our faith right and our salvation right and our eternity right. He has invited us to follow him in our behavior. The text we read as we began our worship service, Matthew 16, 24. If anyone would come after me, let him what? Deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Some of us have been converted, but we are not really doing a great job of following Jesus. Let me illustrate it this way. Each week, Sunday to Saturday, contains 168 hours. I'm not going to ask you what you're doing in all those 168 hours, but you've got 168 hours, just like I have. 168 hours. If you gather with us one Sunday a week for worship, that's one hour. Okay, 52 hours in a year on Sundays when we have the gathered worship experience, 52 hours in a year versus 168 hours every week. I'm going to say something very kindly to all of you. If the extent of your Christian experience is the one Sunday a week you give us, not everybody gives us a Sunday a week. I was hoping that we'd get an old me or an old my or just kind of a chuckle. If the extent of your Christian life is the one hour you give to the worship service every week, you're not really following Jesus. I love you, but you're not. The Bible invites us to more. Jesus invites us to more. And I, here's, here's what that looks like. It means here at our church, we tried to simplify what that looks like. We've invited you to lead our neighbors and nations to follow Jesus by worshiping. Yes, gather and worship with us regularly. Learn. As a follower of Jesus, spend time in his word. Read what the Bible says. Apply it to your own life. Get in a Sunday school class. Find a discipleship group where you can be challenged and encouraged. Some of the most meaningful scripture times I have every week come as a result of the study I do for my discipleship group and the, the sharing I hear from the group of men that are speaking what God has said to them from the word every week. We need to worship. We need to learn. Because a disciple means to be a learner. We don't know all there is to know about what it means to follow Jesus yet. And so God invites us to journey with him to learn and to grow. Worship, learn, serve. Find a place to serve. Just this past, uh, past week of Vacation Bible School, uh, every adult and teenager 
that played a role in Vacation Bible School has played a role in the eternal decision of children to trust Jesus as Lord and Savior. Do you get that? When we serve to glorify God, it is an opportunity for us to participate in God's work in the world. And you know what I, I find about people who serve? They're just generally happier, nicer people. Do you know why? Because they're embracing the quality and the characteristics that Jesus invited them to embrace. Folks, we are called to follow Jesus finally by replicating. It means we're making others into followers of Jesus. That gets us to point number three. Or step of the journey number three. Here it is. We're commissioned to fulfill Jesus' mission. And that's exactly what's taking place in this particular text. Jesus had many followers. There were many hundreds that, that left certain aspects of their daily existence to walk with him as he taught and to be with him as he healed. But there were only 12 that he specifically assigned. I want you to be my apostles. You're going to be my ambassadors. Now, the word apostle means sent one. You're going to be the ones I send out to do something specific and particular. And if you track through the rest of the Gospel of Luke and you look at the other Gospel accounts, basically from this point forward, a year and a half or so before Jesus' death and resurrection, he invited these 12 to specifically go with him on his mission travels, his preaching and his teaching, and to see what it was like to be followers of Christ directly. Why? He invited them to do that because he wanted to commission them. Commission them. Send them when he left. Jesus was preparing for his entrance into heaven by readying these 12 so that they could go spread the gospel to others. That's what he was doing. It's a beautiful picture of exactly what God wants to do with us. He's inviting us to fulfill his mission, and his mission is simply making disciples of all nations. It's leading others to follow him. It's building the life of Christ into other people. Now, now when you look at this text, it says he spent all night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples, and he chose them from the twelve, and he named them apostles. He spent all night in prayer. Some of you are hearing this message, and you might be tempted to think, hold on a second, Pastor, you're just telling me I'm not doing enough to follow Jesus. The reality is, let's just be quite honest, none of us are doing all we should be doing to follow Jesus. That's just bottom line. But when you hear this message, here's what I want you to hear. Jesus is the centerpiece and the empowerment and the glory that's behind all of this. See, he's the one that converts us. He's the one that changes us. You don't come to Jesus on your own, in your own time, in your own way, in your own will. You come to Jesus when Jesus gives you the faith and offers his grace to save you. That's what happens. And, and you don't follow him until he invites you to follow him. And you don't, we don't know what to do until we see his life and we join him. And we don't know how to fulfill his mission until he empowers us to do so. Have you ever wondered why Jesus spent all night in prayer that night? I think some over the years have speculated well, he was trying to find out who God wanted him to choose. You know, I mean, that's what we would do. If I was trying to pick people who would follow me, I'd have to spend all night in prayer or days in prayer. Who in the world, God, do you want? What do you want? I, I don't think Jesus was praying about who to choose. He's God in human flesh. He had the mind of God. He and God were never in conflict in what they wanted and desired, and Jesus was faithful to obey what do you think he was doing that night in prayer then if he wasn't praying about who to choose? I think he was praying for those he would choose. See, some of us are here today, and I'm just going to be honest with you. What, what, we, what we realize is we realize we fall short. We realize we try to step in and, and make sense of a situation. We just cause more mess. That's what Peter did all the time. I mean, you remember Peter, he had all those opportunities to do the right thing. So did the disciples, even that year and a half after following Jesus. On a number of occasions, Jesus said to them, Oh, you have little faith. I mean, they'd seen God do so much, seen Jesus do so much, and they still didn't believe. Still didn't believe. Peter, you know, walking on water. Man, we've got to give him props up for walking on water until he sunk and he had to be rescued. He had that moment on the Mount of Transfiguration. Lord, let's build three tabernacles to you and to Elijah and Moses. Let's do, let's do that. And he had to be called out right after that, right after that or right before that moment. He had confessed that Jesus was the Christ, but then he said, 
Lord, uh, forbid it that you should ever die on the cross. He missed it. He had to be corrected over and over again. I'm just going to be honest with you. That's us. That's where we are. If you take back and look at your faith journey, your, your commission to follow Jesus and to lead others to follow Jesus, how are you doing in that, in that job, in that calling, in that commissioning? If you're like me, you look back and you can see failure after failure after failure after failure. Why was Jesus praying for, him, for them that night? I think he was praying by way of intercession and advocacy. He was praying that they would finally get the empowerment from the Holy Spirit that they needed to do what God wanted them to do. And I, I, I just believe this. Jesus is doing exactly that for us today. He's still praying for us. The book of Hebrews said he, he is our intercession. For he, he intercedes for us. Not did intercede for us in the past. He is interceding for us in the present. First John says he's our advocate. When we sin, we have an advocate that we can go to and he will cleanse us and forgive us. Here's what I want to tell you. If you are not where you need to be on your faith journey of following Christ, then what do you do to get where you need to be on your faith journey of following Christ? You go to Jesus. He's the one who cares about you, who's interceding for you, who advocates for you, who will forgive you, and who will empower you. And he is the one who is praying for you to get it figured out today. John Bunyan put it this way. He said, Christ gave for us the price of blood, but that was not all. Christ as a captain has conquered death and the grave for us, but that is not all. Christ as a priest intercedes for us in heaven, but that is not all. Sin is still in us and with us and mixes itself with whatever we do. Whether we do be religious or civil, for not only our prayers and our sermons, our hearings and our preaching, but our houses, our shops, our trades, our bed, they're all polluted with sin. Nor does the devil, our night and day adversary, forbear to tell our bad deeds to the Father, urging that we might forever be disinherited for this. But what should we do now if we had not an advocate? Yes, if we had not one who would plead. Yes, if we had not one that could prevail, that would faithfully execute that office for us. What would we do if Jesus didn't advocate for us? Bunyan says, we must die. But since... Hear this, since we are rescued by him, let us, as to ourselves, lay our hand upon our mouth and be silent. Jesus is inviting us. Rather, he's commanding us. He's commissioning us to say that what our lives are to be about are his mission, which is bringing our family members and our neighbors and sinners all over the world to faith relationship with himself. And you say, but I'm not worthy. I'm carrying all this sin with me. You're right. Neither were Peter, James, John. They weren't worthy either. But they were called. They had been converted. And Jesus commissioned them to the task of taking the gospel to the nations. Let me apply this very specifically and give you a picture and then give you kind of an insight to close up. Here's the application. First, believe in Jesus and be converted. If you're here today and you haven't put your faith in Jesus alone, I would invite you today to put your faith in Jesus alone and be converted. Think about that for those around you. They need salvation. Pray that they'll be converted. Application number two, follow Jesus by worshiping, learning, serving, and replicating. You say, I don't know where to start in following Jesus. Then gather with us every week to worship. Spend time learning, whether that's in a Sunday school class or a discipleship group or in your own personal quiet time. Find a place to serve. Don't just say that your Christian life is intake. Realize that your Christian life is giving away what God has blessed you, talents and gifts and energy. Find a place to serve and replicate. Find where you are on your spiritual journey and where you're short. Let's say you're worshiping every week. Fantastic. Find a Sunday school class next. Take the next step of learning. It doesn't have to be more complicated. It, sometimes we make it too complicated. Let's start simple. If you're worshiping, find a place to learn. If you're worshiping and learning, find a place to serve. If you're worshiping, learning, and serving, then pray to God and ask Him how He can help you to replicate the life of Jesus and someone else. I'll give you a third application. Fulfill Jesus' mission by giving your life to the work of the gospel. Some of you sit out there in the, in the worship service and you think, well, that's, Pastor, what you've done. 
Or that's what missionaries do. Yeah, it's calling. God said to me a long time ago, I want you to preach my word. I want you to be faithful to do this. This is your life. But the commissioning of the disciples wasn't just for the vocationally called. It's for everybody. Here's what I believe. I believe God wants us to pray for unreached people groups every single month in the life of our church. I believe God wants us to help missionaries. I believe God wants us to go on the mission field. And I believe God wants some of you to do that with your very life. I believe some of those in Wilkesboro Baptist Church, God wants to raise up and send out. Where God wants you, because he's taken care of you, he's blessed you, he's provided for you, and I don't know what days you have left, what numbers of life you have left, but I just believe this. God wants us to give up what we have, our lives, for the glory of the gospel. Jim Elliott, the missionary martyr to the Alka Indians in the 1950s, put it this way. He said, he is no fool to give up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Jim Elliott believed God wanted him to go on the mission field, and he prayed for about six to eight years about what that would look like. And God put him and some other missionaries in a place where they were bearing fruit. They were seeing converts. They were developing a, a nascent church there in Ecuador among some of the tribes of Indians. But God had put on their heart to go to the Alka Indians, the cannibal Indians, the murderous Indians, the Indians that no one had ever met with because everyone that met with them died. And five missionaries went on one journey to meet with the Alka Indians after delivering gifts and receiving gifts by air and some other methods. And those Alka Indians that they went to tell how they could have eternal life took the lives of five missionaries. Jim was a young man and not seen much obvious results for his calling and commissioning. And many might look at his life and the life of those other four missionaries and say, what a waste. You know what Jim would be saying in heaven? He would be saying, what a gift. Because their wives stayed behind and went and shared the good news of Jesus Christ with the same Indians that killed them. And they came to faith in Christ. I'll tell you something, folks. Some of us, maybe all of us, need to be willing to give up our lives for the glory and the future of the gospel. And let me tell you why. That's the what. That's the picture of what it could look like. Let me tell you why. Just think a little deeper about what Jesus was doing in that prayer time that night. The Bible said he prayed all night. I've had some all-nighters in my life, but never an all-night prayer meeting. Maybe you have. I, I think for sure, on a number of occasions, my mama had some all-night prayer meetings. Probably with regard to my behavior, but that's another story for another day, another sermon. Jesus prayed all night. Just get this. He came out of that prayer meeting. And yeah, he selected Peter. We get that. We see what Peter did in the book of Acts. He selected James and John. We get that too, right? Because John wrote the gospel and he wrote the letters and he wrote the book of Revelation. You know, we may have a little more trouble with Simon the Zealot or even with Matthew because he was a tax collector. But even Matthew wrote one of the most beautiful gospels. My favorite gospel is the gospel of Matthew. It's hard to say, but I love the gospel of Matthew. Just love the way it's written and organized. And he chose Matthew. But did you catch that he chose Judas. He selected the one who would betray him and invited that one to journey with him for a year and a half. Just get why he did that. He did that because that night prayer meeting wasn't just to intercede. I don't think for the disciples it was that. It's also to pray for him himself to be prepared. Because Jesus always knew what the end was. The end was going to be his death and his resurrection. If Jesus commissioned his disciples, knowing that he would go to the cross for our sins, knowing that one of the ones he chose, the specific purpose of that one that he chose was to betray him so that he would die on the cross, then folks, his choosing of us is not based on what we do. His choosing of us is based on what he wants to do in and through us. And he's inviting us to follow him.
close with this quote. After all, he didn't simply leave heaven for me. He endured hell for me. He, not deserving to be condemned, absorbed it in my place. I, who alone deserved it. Folks, that is his heart. And in our empty souls, like a glass of cold water to a thirsty mouth, God has poured his Holy Spirit to internalize the actual experience of God's love. That's the Jesus that says to you and me today, be commissioned to fulfill my mission. Would you? Stand with me, if you will. Father, we do not deserve your forgiveness. Rather, we have truly earned your punishment, your just wrath for our sinfulness. Forgive us. As I've reflected this week on this sermon and this text and the disciples, Heavenly Father, I find myself one who falls short so often. One who messes things up rather than makes things better. And Lord God, you didn't choose me because one day I'd be a pastor, preacher. You chose me out of your grace, out of the abundance of your mercy, the kindness and love of your desire to intercede for my sinfulness. And Lord, you didn't commission me because of something special I would do commission me because there is a world out here. There are neighbors, there are friends, and there are the nations who have yet to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ who you love and you sent Jesus to die for them too. Heavenly Father, thank you for the forgiveness you've offered me and offered us. Thank you for saving us by faith. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for commissioning us. Now I pray that we, the people who have been redeemed and rescued, I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would let you work in and through us to spread the good news of your Son to others who desperately need the gospel. Lord, send us to a friend, to a neighbor, to a family member. Send us to somebody who needs the gospel and open our mouths to share and make us the followers of you that would make the difference in the world that you desire. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We're glad to have you worship with us online today. If you'd like to learn more about following Jesus or you'd like more information about Wilkesboro Baptist Church, visit our website, wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us, info at Again, thank you for worshiping with us.